Welcome and greetings to the H.Eco Forum 2021 at Nodeo Island. I'm Gerd Leonhardt, futurist in Zurich, Switzerland. It's my great pleasure to give you a keynote today about the future of this circular economy. I want to greet all the viewers and watchers from all over the world and of course in South Korea and anywhere else. And I want to thank the Herald Corporation for bringing me to this event and, uh, and, and putting me in front of you. And, allow me to give you the keynote. So let's dive right in and talk about how sustainable is becoming the new profitable. And let's start right here. We know, of course, that because of the COVID crisis, the world is becoming a different place. And it's not just a crisis anymore. It's also an opportunity for a reset. People are thinking differently. They're acting differently. They're asking for different things. And it's kind of like we go and we restructure the world in a new way. The World Economic Forum talks about the global reset or the great reset. I call it the great transformation. Uh, and this is really what's happening is because of COVID, now climate change and sustainability and global warming, decarbonization is moving into the center of the discussion much quicker than before. COVID-19 has been a giant accelerator for everything that was there before, but now it's moving warp speed into that future. When we look at this great Google time lapse, Google Earth time lapse uh, recording of how the world has changed, this is Dubai, then we can safely say it's been mind boggling how humans have changed the entire world, well, not the cosmos, but the world uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that's been unprecedented and that's been so fast and exponential, we have arrived at the Anthropocene, you know, the, the, the point in time where humans are the dominating factor. And now we have to think about what that means and what kind of responsibility we have. Looking at the, the statistics here, I mean, one of them really interesting in, in my view is this one. I'll, I'll try to get, give you a little bit more space in seeing this one. <laughs> um, this is the biomass of the world is now actually the first time the natural biomass of the world is, is less than the stuff that we've built. For example, concrete, metal, asphalt, and bricks. We've built more stuff then the entire earth weighs by itself. I mean, that is a mind-boggling statistic. And now we're moving into a future where basically what's happening is produce capital and money right, increasing, especially, of course, in developed countries, who, human capital, what we are creating for ourselves, not really increasing very much, but total decline on natural capital. And of course, we know that can't possibly work because we're going to in the future where we're going to have more money, but there won't be any planet to spend it on. I mean, you can't do business on a broken planet. And yes, you can go to other planets, but that's some time off. Right? So this is a very, very serious situation. I always say that we are at the fork in the road. Buckminster Fuller yeah, who talked about dystopia and utopia. We are the place where we're making decisions every day about what our future can be and should be. And we're deciding the future of our children at every moment in the next decade and of course after that, because the next 10 years will bring more change than the previous 100 years. You know, we are at the intersection of possibilities. We can do everything, but will we do the right thing? This is of course a key issue. Climate change has been a discussion for 50 years, but Last year, we saw in San Francisco, of course, the, uh, the great effects of natural disasters in California and the smog that was happening everywhere. And here are some facts from Bill Gates' latest book, right, the CO2 culprits making things. You know, cement, steel, plastic, that is a huge impact, plugging in, growing things, getting around. I mean, all of those things we have to tackle. But, you know, making things and plugging in and growing things, obviously, that is going to be global decarbonization as a major effort. My view is COVID-19 is a test run for climate change. And especially in your region or in Asia, we have to think about what that means. That means we are able to make compromises because of COVID. And now we've learned if we work together, we can actually make it happen. It will take a bit of sacrifices for all of us and it will take wise government, which I'll talk about in a second. But, you know, Larry Fink, the biggest investor in the world, really, from BlackRock Capital, he said he believes the pandemic, pandemic has presented an existential crisis. You know? It reminds us how fragile everything is and it's driven us to confront the global threat of climate change, to, to act more forcefully. And like the pandemic, it will alter our lives. And now I think we are getting ready saying, well, we don't want another breakdown of everything like we did in the pandemic. 
We want to be prepared. We want to take action before it happens. We want to listen to the experts and the, sci the scientists and de develop wise policies. And this is why it's so great you guys are having this event. I mean, the future of our world is the circular economy, is su sustainable, or there will not be a future. On the cover of, of Time magazine, just a couple of weeks ago, climate is everything. And that's not a new story, right? But this story is hot now. And it's the next big story. This is a story that everybody is believing at, even the most backwards corporation and countries in the world. Right? The pandemic changed everything, and now it's climate's uh, turn of doing that. Spurred by alarming science, right? the quote says, we are finally waking up to say that climate is everything. This is a fantastic opportunity, the decarbonization of the world society in the next 10 years, trillions of dollars shifting, new jobs being invented, new possibilities erupting, and then we can even go back and fix the damage, right? That is another thing we need to talk about. Right? Al Gore, who invented the term sustainable capitalism, he says, we're now finally at the long-awaited tipping point. That's why the timing is so good for your event, for your event, because I really think we, we have not seen anything yet. You know, you ain't seen nothing yet as the song goes, right? You may remember we're starting with the whole uh, transformation that COVID brought to us. And now it's about climate change. And the next is the new economic logic. Our current economic logic is completely broken. It will not solve the problem of the future. It's unfit. Yeah? Capitalism as we know it is unfit for the future. That's not just me saying, that's like everywhere coming up. We have to change our economic logic to be more than profit and growth, to be about people, planet, purpose, prosperity, which I'll talk about in a minute. So that is a very big point. We are not going back to business as usual, even after the pandemic, when it does finally end, when we have a rebound. Business as usual is dead. And the companies that pursue business as usual will die as well and your careers will die if you pursue business as usual. Business is unusual now. The business of humanity has dramatically changed. Moving, you know, take an example from the US, how their pivot happened just the last couple of months, right? I mean, talk about turning the boat around. This will have huge impact on the circular economy and the future of the world, the decarbonization, what is happening in America and of course also in Europe. But on a global level, it's all going the same direction. Right? Rapid decarbonization, circular economy, sustainable, everything. And this is driven, of course, by technology as well. I call it big blue tech and big green. Right? Those things are coming together because we're living in exponential times. You know, we're not changing linearly one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We are leaping. And if you haven't noticed that, you should because you know, what didn't work 10 years ago can work perfectly well today, like music in the cloud or cloud computing, intelligent machines, and the story goes on, right? Especially in South Korea, you have a lot of those innovations. So one, two, four, eight, sixteen. we are leaping. Here's some facts. Moore's law, Metcalf's law. Uh, Metcalf means the power of networks, very powerful social network law, basically. Wright's law, that things are getting cheaper when the production increases, and of course the original exponential law, Moose law. This is the biggest mistake we can make, is to not pay attention to this, because in the beginning, the short-term view looks very much like the long-term view. Right? It looks like this, or, or, or like this, is almost the same. But the reality is that if we're not paying attention to the long-term view, and that things are exponential, we're going to get derailed. And now we're at four, right? Eight, sixteen, thirty-two, not four, five, six, seven. Very important to keep that in mind as the game changes are coming. You know, I call this the game changes, the ten rules of technology that are explosive, the ten powers, right? Cloud computing, big data, the Internet of Things, uh, quantum computing, language translation, natural language processing, intel intelligent machines, AI, uh, blockchain, three D printing and of course virtual reality and so on. Basically what we're seeing here is a dramatic explosion of possibilities of te technology as the cost reduction trend goes towards zero. Uh, whether it's about LEDs or battery power or data storage or solar PV, you know, we're basically coming to the point where all the technology is driving the cost dramatically down and the answer is can we do this uh, to the question can we do this it's a definitive yes 
we will have all the tools, but will we have the telos, you know, the Greek word for will and wisdom. This is essential. We have to realize that we have to have the will to actually do this. We have to put the money in the right place and we have to put our hearts in the right place to make those changes. Right? Sustainable everything has reached escape velocity. This is like the rocket that goes around the earth at a certain point. It can cut free and go off to the, the cosmos, right? It's kind of like we have reached takeoff point for sustainable everything. It is possible, it's affordable, it's becoming more affordable, it's going to be much cheaper in the near future and we can finally do what we have to do. Sustainable everything is no longer an ideology. It's no longer for the Green Party, it's no longer for Greenpeace, right? It's humanity's business plan is to be sustainable in everything that we're doing. And that opportunity is a trillion dollar, I think McKinsey said, in fact, 82 trillion dollar opportunity, shifting our, our work environment, creating new jobs, creating new research possibilities, and our work's gonna shift away from oil and gas and, and, and fossil fuels you know, to uh, renewable fuels. Right? The World Economic Forum has some really great stats on this, showing roughly 395 million new jobs in the next decade or two. So this is all very hopeful, and then we have to basically get to this and say, oh, you know, what's happening around us really is that this old concept of the circular economy, which is not new, right, it's been around for a while, it's becoming real, and, and people are pulling out their money and investing in ESG funds, right? They're investing in funds that are focusing on sustainable environmental social governance issues, right? That is exploding, the returns are exploding, you're gonna see the money shift there, and when the money shifts, our attitude shifts and our, the way that we're doing this. And tide is coming in, in this combination of what I call big tech, technology making it possible, and science, of course, and big green. That is the ticket to the future, along, of course, with the right decision making, right, as the great divestment is, is essentially going on. You know, we're, we're seeing this move out of coal, and coal is already a thing of the past. You know, that was unthinkable just five years ago, but it's new, it's here, right? 10 years, it's the end of oil. And the end of oil does not mean we won't have any oil. It just means it won't be lucrative anymore. You know, the great divestment is happening here. Let's remember this, there is no vaccine for the climate crisis. We can't just, you know, treat it. We certainly can't go back for the time being, but there is a treatment and that treatment to the climate crisis is the circular economy. And that is an answer to prevent further damage and eventually to go backwards, right? Big blue, technology, big green, which means emphasis on decarbonization, new government policies, the end of fossil fuel subsidies, and big state, you could say, right, big policy. I mean, how are we going to solve this problem without government involvement that we're not? Right? Because it can't just be business and the free markets that decide to change, because it doesn't work that way, right? If, a, if the benefit, if the, if the focus is on profit, then how are we going to change ever anything about the green economy? Right? We have to subsidize it, we have to make it come about, and then it becomes a business. So policy is absolutely crucial. The right policy, the right support, the right future vision. I guarantee you there will not be a single politician left in the world that will not have this on top of the agenda, otherwise I won't be elected. So looking at this, we're also gonna go back to global hyper-collaboration. Right now there's a bit of a pulling back from supply chain and so on, and multilateralism. But, you know, we're going to go back there because the only way we're going to solve those large problems, you know, food, water, power, uh, and, and other rated issues, you know, poverty and so on, is through collaboration on a, on, a, on a global level. And that is, I think, where contribution can come in from smart companies to create higher level thinking and solve global problems together. And also, we're going to need sort of an, as I say, an EPA for humanity, a protection agency. I call this the Humanity Futures Council. I used to call it Digital Ethics Council, but this is better because it's a larger view. We need people to help us to figure out what our future is, not what it can be. It can be anything. We can become robots and move to Mars. <laughs> this is not just science fiction. I'm Elon Musk is working on that. We need a council of the wise people in every country, in every city, on a national, on a regional level to say, you know what, this, this needs to be done or this can be done, but it shouldn't be done. It has a lot to do with values and ethics. You know? So this is something I would suggest to everybody uh, around the world listening to put together a futures council. 
of the wise people, like Socrates kind of people, you know, ancient Greece, you know, not necessarily CEOs or functionaries, but hey, you know, let's, let's discuss how that could work. <laughs> so, as we go in this future, the unthinkable is becoming the new normal. Okay, what that means is like carbon taxes that are already here are going to be absolutely vastly covering every part of our life to finally pay what it costs, starting with flying and airline tickets, going on with meat, going on with agricultural production, because that money is going to be the ticket for changing the way that we want to do things in the future. Unthinkable becomes the new normal. Get used to it. The next 10 years will not go back to normal. We're going to go back to unthinkable. Uh, we're going to create a bunch of new normals. Very, very powerful changes, like here in the meat industry, we can clearly see here that global meat consumption, we're going to go to cultured meat and vegan meat replacement and cultured meat from the lab and, and, uh, and plant-based. I mean, that is a huge business that many rich people have uh, invested in, Bill Gates and Richard Branson. That right now, it's like a $1,000 a pound, but the future holds it's going to be one-tenth of regular meat. The future, in fact, is very likely to be vegetarian, with an asterisk saying that vegetarian, of course, you know, meat from the lab isn't vegetarian, but it, it is without animals, right, without dead animals. So the future is vegetarian. Think about that for a second, what that means. I'm not a vegetarian, but clearly that's going to be a huge character shift. So just a little while ago, we were standing in front of this environmental issue and the sustainability issue and the energy issue, and there was a huge labyrinth and we were getting lost. But in a very short time, all of a sudden, we are here and we're saying, yes, we're the fork the road, we have to make the right decisions. We know what they are, now we have to have the guts to pull it off. Green is the new digital, sustainable will be the new profitable. The new way to look at the world will be to be sustainable, not just to be profitable. It's going to be the triple bottom line of things like these examples are showing, you know, even whiskey companies are now thinking about getting away from glass. Uh, and, and, and Lego is uh, looking at different kind of packaging and different brick materials. And of course, the idea of constantly reuse, reusing and recycling is everywhere. That is becoming the default business model. Yeah, it's going to be more expensive initially, but the prices will go down and it will become cheaper than before. And it will have huge lifestyle consequences as we're trying to address this fundamental problem of messing up our planet for good. And, and basically having to look for a way out in 20 years if we continue like this. The key question, of course, is what kind of future do you want to leave your children? This kind of hopeless scenario. And, and, the, and the problem is, of course, capitalism as we know it you know, won't work here because this is going to be not just about free markets. It's going to be what we want and how we're going to get to it and agreeing, right? It requires us to go beyond capitalism, sustainable capitalism, renewable capitalism, uh, Milton Friedman, right, from the 70s, yeah, no, this will not work. It's unfit for the future, this traditional econ economic logic. To engage in activities that produce profit, that's it? No, that can't be it because that will kill us. And we, are, we have noticed how that works with nuclear bombs, where we had this kind of power and we weren't using it right. So very important, I think, for now to switch to this new paradigm, and I think this is totally crucial when we talk about circular, provides the argument that people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. Not just prosperity, not just profit, right? And not degrowth. I think degrowth is a very bad argument. Of course, we're going to have to cut back and grow less sometimes, but, but it's not going to be about not growing. This is what we do, humans. You know, we're naturally growing and, and inventing, doing stuff. But holistic, sustainable, and managed growth and organized growth and giving back, circular growth, that, that is entirely different than not growing and, and going back to resetting. Right? So let me give you a summary uh, of what I meant and how it all hangs together. So what do we do now? Right? Well, this is an important scene you may remember from Blade Runner, the original one, and a great quote from, uh, from Buckminster Fuller and uh, his disciple Barbara Hubbard. She said, as we see the future, so we act. As we act, so we become. That means as you're looking at the future, you're expecting the future to be lousy or bad or bleak. It will be that way. When you see hope in the future, you see a good future coming up, you see possibilities, you act differently, and then the world is different, becoming different. This is the kind of scenario that we have to look at and say, yes, we can do this, and yes, it is possible, and the good future is right in front of us. Here's a couple examples from the good future. 
prioritizing what cities look like and using smart technology to share things and using smart healthcare to help people before they get sick and smart agriculture and circular agriculture, of course, using technology to make it possible faster and more convenient. And of course, everything will be connected in that future. Here's the recipe for sustainable capitalism. It has to be exponentially changing because that's what technology does. But we need to look at a holistic way of doing things, a circular way of doing everything and creating human benefit. You know, human benefit also means the planet, right? keeping our environment intact or making it intact again. Those are the three sort of future principles I use a lot when I speak about sustainable capitalism and the circular economy. And lastly, let's not think about ourselves as receiving the future. This is a very common problem in Asia, but also in Europe, not so much in America. Right? We're not lying there here useless and, 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 and just letting the future happen. No, the future is better than we think. We just have to make the right decisions and the future will come much faster than we think. The future isn't about tomorrow. The future is in our heads. So it's a mindset, it's a way that we look at things. It is a distinct possibility that we take or not, it's action or inaction. And finally, the future is created by the choices that we make, not by somebody else's choices. Yes, societal choices, private choices, both of those together. That is going to be essential. That's how we're going to build the circular economy by making the choices and making the right moves and bringing people with us and changing the way that we look at the future. I want to thank you very much for your time and for your attention. It's my great pleasure to speak at the H.Echo Forum. Uh, and I'd love to have a debate with you sometime. And thanks very much for your patience, for listening, and for the Herald Corporation to bring me to this event. Thank you.